I've chosen the title Don't Mess With ID uh, because we're going to see what happens when you do. Now, if you're an evolutionist, particularly if you're an atheistic evolutionist, um, there are several challenges out there. And one of them is flat out creationism. Um, usually that can be attacked uh, by arguing about age, and specifically radiometric dating seems to be the easiest way to discredit it. And in fact, if you're talking about young universe creationism, the easiest way is to say, well, look, there are stars out there 100 million light years away. It took like 100 million years to get here. How can you say the universe was all correct? Uh, created in 6,000 or 10,000 or even 20,000 years. There's theistic evolution, which has kind of split under the pressure of, of uh, uh, naturalistic evolution to either God guides evolution in ever upward paths, which is the old form, or that God set the process up, washed his hands, walked away, and see what we've got here. And uh, those two are fundamentally different. The one that is God guides, the next question is, well, can you detect that God guides? And that leads to the idea of intelligent design. Intelligent design doesn't say how God did it or how anything did it, in fact. It just simply says there's a design. It's there. It's not explicable by naturalistic evolution. And that one is the toughest challenge right now for standard evolutionary theory for two reasons. Number one, it has the strongest arguments. If they sound like creationist arguments, well, they were used by creationists before. That's not a big surprise. But they are actually simply arguments against naturalism without some kind of intelligence. And intelligent design has a low profile to try to damage. That is to say, you can't say, well, if that's the case, God's a mean God because, because the comeback from intelligent design is who said anything about God? And so evolution has to defend itself rather than concentrate on attacking the attacker. And that defense isn't very good. So what do you do? When you're trying to defend, uh, when you're trying to defend yourself from a challenger that doesn't have an obvious easy way to attack yet, well, one of the th one of the things to try to do is to ignore intelligent design arguments and to tell everybody else to do the same. In a uh, blog post entitled "Lies, Damned Lies, Statistics." and probability of abiogenesis calculations uh, by Ian Musgrave, which is found at Talk Origins. Fairly standard, gets ref people referred to it every once in a while, and is considered um, pretty strong work by many people, including P.Z. Meyer. Um, I'll quote you the introduction, and you can see how you do this. Every so often, someone comes up with a statement, the formation of any enzyme by chance is nearly impossible, therefore abiogenesis is impossible. I'm sure you've heard those kinds of arguments before. Often they cite an impressive looking calculation from the astrophysicist Fred Hoyle, or trot out something called Borel's Law, which uh, basically says anything that's over 10 to the minus 50th in probability is not gonna happen. To prove that life is statistically impossible, these people, including Fred, have committed one or more of the following errors. And then he has his title, Problems with Creations, It's So Improbable Calculations. This is taken straight off the internet. One, they calculate the probability of formation of a modern protein or even a complete bacterium with all modern proteins by random events. This is not the abiogenesis theory at all. I'm glad to see that there is one. 
Um, they assume that there is a fixed number of proteins with fixed sequences for each protein that are required for life. Three, they calculate the probability of sequential trials rather than simultaneous trials. Four, they misunderstood, mi misunderstand what is meant by a probability calculation. Five, they seriously underestimate the number of functional enzymes or ribozymes present in a group of random sequences. So they do all these things. So now we're going to correct everything and we're going to show you what the probability calculations really are. Right? Well, here's the last part of the introduction. I will try and walk people through these various errors and show why it is not possible to do a probability of a biogenesis calculation in any meaningful way. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's not only not improbable. Um, we have a mic here. <laughs> so, so it's not only not probable, now it's not even possible to be probable. It's not possible to calculate. So therefore, you know, forget all that stuff. Uh, those people are just spewing lies of various kinds. It doesn't matter how generous your calculations are in their assumptions, they're just wrong. You can't do the calculations. At this point, I thought science could do anything. But, but see, that's how well, it's done. Well, well but, 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 but this, I'm not sure what he's actually driving at here. Is he trying to say that the process is legitimate, but the calculations are not possible because we don't have all the data? Uh, or is he trying to say that uh, the process itself is fraught with problems because of which the calculations have no basis? Well, let's, let's go through a little bit more, and maybe we can understand a little bit more about why he's saying what he's saying. But what I want to point out is that the defense is not to say these are the actual calculations. The defense is to say the calculations can't be done for whatever reason. Here's the conclusion, so that you can, maybe this will help. The very premise of creationist probability calculations is incorrect in the first place, as it aims at the wrong theory. Furthermore, this argument is often buttressed with statistical and biological fallacies. So it's got the wrong theory, so of course, it, all those calculations where you hear, you know, 10 to the minus whatever probability, that's just balderdash. At the moment, He's actually going to do a little bit of probability calculation here. Since we have no idea of how probable life is, well, we know it's pretty uh, improbable because of Pasteur. If it was highly probable, Pasteur would be wrong. Um, it's virtually impossible to assign any meaningful probabilities to any of the steps of life except the first two. Monomers to polymers, probability equals 1.0. Uh, okay. I suppose that what he's saying is that if you have monomers, they'll inevitably be polymers. But that can't be true because if you have a jar of glycine sitting in your uh, chemistry lab, it doesn't polymerize to polyglycine while it's sitting in the jar. When you pull it out, it will still be 99.9 something percent glycine. <coughs> So monomers to polymers, this is an abuse of probability in the other direction. For, formation of catalytic polymers, probability is 1.0. This business about monomers to polymers, we know from studies of diagenesis and uh, degradation of things that have died that polymers remain polymers for a certain length of time. And over time, they're generally degraded. 
Yes. Why? Because most polymers are polymers by condensation reaction by removal of a water molecule. Correct. So all you need is a, a, an insertion of a water molecule back and you have the opening up of the po uh, polymer. Right. Now on this planet we have plenty of water in vapor in, in all settings. So hydrolysis is one of the most common uh, forms of uh, degradation of molecules even within living organisms, not even requiring dead ones. And you have to have elaborate repair mechanisms just to counter ordinary hydrolysis. I know. So to then turn around and say that the probability of forming polymers from monomers is in one. a spontaneous way is a probability of one, which means certainty, is, 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 is silliness because the real probability is that the polymers will turn to monomers given enough time. That's right. In fact, you know, uh, in fact, you can calculate this pretty easily if you have, um, uh, if you have a, uh, if you have glycine and you put it in with, say, glycine three, then you can uh, uh, maybe put a little acid in there and see what happens. And and the probability of f forming glycine three is something like one in a hundred thousand or something like that. It's it, so so why how you can call it one is beyond me, unless I guess you're arguing that it happened, therefore it could happen. Well, what is, I think well. is because it happened to one molecule, the probability is one. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's what he's saying. You're. In a, I, I know, <laughs> but I think that's an abusive probability in the other direction. Absolutely, but if you if you just put two monomers together, you've got a probability of one. Uh, yeah, never mind whether totally, it happens once every... Which totally uh, ignores the complexity of necessary... Uh, for it the totally product. ignores it. It, it. I mean, you know, Sidney Fox, when he finally got proteins, or he got uh, amino acids to join together, had to put them at 1,100 degrees. At 1,200 degrees, they would char. At less than 1,100 degrees, they wouldn't combine. And he had to use two-thirds uh, of either aspartic or glutamic acid. Um, which, of course, meant the product had two-thirds aspartic and glutamic acid, which is not surprising. Um, that's tough. To call that a probability of one is, is stretching it a little, shall we say. For the replicating polymers to hypercycle transition, the probability may well be 1.0 if Kaufman is right about catalytic closure in his phase transition models. But this requires real chemistry and more detailed modeling to confirm. So maybe it's one. But we're not going to stick our necks out. We're going to say that, well, that hasn't been proven yet. For the hypercycle to protobiont transition, the probability is here is dependent on theoretical concepts still being developed and is unknown. Well, there is the practical experiments, which shows that all living things die, but nothing goes back from dead to living. Um, but we won't count those. <laughs> but my point is not so much that he's wrong. Oh, yes, one last little line. However, in the end, life's feasibility depends on chemistry and biochemistry that we are still studying, not coin flipping. So he's saying, you see, you just can't apply this. Yeah. If you do apply it, you have to put one. <laughs> that means certainty. That means certainty. Um, uh, but, but what I want, you, what I want to call to your attention is not so much what he's saying as what it, what it implies as to the defense. You see, if you don't have a good answer, the best thing to do is to simply say nobody has the answer. Or disqualify someone else. Uh, and so, you know, don't look at the problem. Don't look at the difficulties because the fact of the matter is nobody mm -hmm. knows we should all, you know, 
throw up our hands and say that's one of the great mysteries of life and, uh, and not get caught up in the details because if you get caught up in the details you know where those probabilities are going. This is the reason why one sees arguments such as there are no peer-reviewed publications by intelligent design advocates and accredited scientists don't believe in intelligent design. And if you're wondering, that's why they're, they're all basically, they're trying to foreclose the discussion before it begins. You see, you don't even talk about the problem because once you get into it, uh, your side's probably going to lose and you really don't want that. And that is also why John Ashton wrote a book in six days, Why 50 Scientists Choose to Believe in Creation. And the reason, you know, is that, hey, look, it isn't true that there are, uh, are no accredited scientists who don't who believe in intelligent design. Uh, uh, may I ask, what does it mean to be accredited scientist as opposed to just a scientist? Well, it's a scientist with a PhD, you know. Well, is that it? Yeah. Well, no, it's really in a scientist who understands evolution. Well, did Darwin have a PhD? Um, no comment. Uh, about fif 10 of those 50 scientists are Seventh-day Adventists. That's true. That's true. And in fact, these scientists are even closer. They're, they're believing in a six-day creation a few thousand years ago. So, or seven-day creation, if you please. Whichever, nobody's going to argue over that. Um... And this is why when Steve Meyer wrote an article called The Origin of Biological Information in the Higher Taxonomic Categories, which has now become a book published in the Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington, it was retracted. It was not enough for them to say this is a bad article. And here are the five reasons why. The fact of the matter is they couldn't come up with five really good reasons why. You see, what you had to do was to get it off the record. It is very important to the retractors that the article, rather than being simply critically reviewed and slammed down hard, was made to not exist. May, may I comment on this? First of all, my postdoc mentor has said this to all of us, but as his parting words uh, was this, Remember, you can always publish, you cannot unpublish. Once the article was published, retracting it officially or unofficially or whatever just drew more attention to it. Now, everybody wants to know what was it that was retracted. And I had no trouble getting it, a copy of it. It is still fully available to anybody who looks it up in the Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington. And for a very simple reason, because you can't, how should I say, once a book has been published and distributed, you cannot undistribute it. You can't unring the bell. You can't unring the bell. You know, it's, it, there is no such thing. There is no such process. But they tried. And if you read Wikipedia, they succeeded. <laughs> because, because the whole point is that you, some things just simply aren't true because, uh, because nobody actually believes and they haven't been done through the peer-reviewed literature. It kind of reminds me of a Jewish rabbi once that um, the question that was asked of him was, have any of the Pharisees or the chief priests believed in him? But these people who know not the law, they're accursed. But that's the strategy. Now, recently others, including Michael B., have been able to publish in the peer-reviewed literature, and some have tried a different tactic writing articles attempting to discredit those of Behe and company. But this must be done with care. Consider the cautionary tale 
of Durrett and Schmidt. Durrett and Schmidt wrote an article called Waiting for Two Mutations with Applications for Regulatory Sequence Evolution and the Limits of Darwinian Evolution. There's uh, Rick Durrett and Dina Schmidt in Genetics in November 2008, and there's the reference if you want to look at it um, online. Those of you who get the email got that reference ahead of time. Results of NOAC and collaborators concerning the onset of cancer due to the inactivation of tumor suppressor genes. Notice that this is drawing from all kinds of crazy places, cancer therapy. Science is a unity. Gives the distribution of the time until some individual in a population has experienced two pre-specified mutations and the time until this mutant phenotype becomes fixed in the population. In this article, we apply these results to obtain insights into regulatory sequence evolution in Drosophila and in humans. In particular, we examine the waiting time for a pair of mutations, the first of which inactivates an existing transcription factor binding site, and the second of which creates a new one. Consistent with recent experimental observations for Drosophila, we find that a few million years is sufficient but for humans, with a much smaller effective population size, this type of change would take over 100 million years. Remember, there are only 5 million years between chimps and humans. And, that, <laughs> and that's just two mutations. And that's just two mutations. One mutation is neutral, one is beneficial, so that when the second one happens, it takes off. In addition, we use these results to expose flaws in some of Michael Behe's arguments concerning mathematical limits to Darwinian evolution. <laughs> ah, got him! <laughs> well, let's, what did Michael Behe say before we go on too much further so that you can get an idea? Evolution, he, he wrote a book, you know, called The Edge of Evolution. He said evolution has an edge. And I'll just, you know, give a real quick uh, argument for that. Certain kinds of bacterial resistance to antibiotics are probably the result of evolution. They happen in evolutionary time. It makes sense. Malarial resistance to anti-malarialis is probably also a evolutionary, and he spends a lot of time talking about that. And I'm going to throw in a third one of my own. A white coat in polar bears, arctic foxes, and ptarmigans is probably evolutionarily based. Um, some events, though, he would say, are beyond the reach of evolution. Cockroaches from bacterial cultures in one day are beyond the reach of evolution. If you put out a bacterial culture and you come back in the morning and there is a cockroach in it, it did not evolve. <laughs> As a matter of fact, if you put a culture out and you come back in two weeks and there's a cockroach in it, it did not evolve. Now, probably three million years is not long enough. Um, could you get a bacterial culture into a cockroach in three billion years? Well, that's a question. Uh, of course, the standard evolutionary answer would be yes. Because it started out as bacteria and it turned into cockroaches in three billion years. But Somewhere, there is a limit. Could you get it in 100 million years? Could you get it in 1 million years? Um, where is that limit? Or is 3 billion years not even enough, really? And you had to have something help the bacteria to become cockroaches. Behe proposed an edge on page 57 of his book. And here's the passage. On the other hand, Resistance to chloroquine has appeared fewer than 10 times in the whole world in the past half century. Nicholas White of Mahidol University in Thailand points out that if you multiply the number of parasites in a person who's very ill with malaria, times the number of people who get malaria per year, times the number of years since the introduction of chloroquine, 
Then you can estimate that the odds of a parasite developing resistance to the chloroquine is roughly one in 100 billion billion. In shorthand scientific notation, that's one in 10 to the 20th. Now I want you to notice something. You see this little number 16? That means that B, he didn't come up with this on his own. B actually had a reference, White and J2004, Antimalarial Drug Resistance Journal of Clinical Investigation. You can look it up. So when B, he comes, pulls this number 10 to 20, it's not out of his hat. At the most, it's out of somebody else's hat, and it actually makes sense. And it got through peer review. Now, <coughs> Durrett and Schmidt argue that if you grant that 1 over a probability of one, in, uh, 1 change happening is much less than 2n, which is the number of, of uh, uh, copies of the, of the gene there are, which is, means the number of people, if you're doing it, or the number of bacteria in one case which is, again, much less than a second mutation. Actually, U2 and U1, mm -hmm. the, much less than the first mutation, and this is the second one. That, and if you allow that a particular uh, constant has to do with um, uh, the probability that uh, this uh, creature will survive, then the mean time to the development of two new mutations where one is neutral and one is positively selected is equal to this complicated number. Now, let me just point out that R is a uh, related to rho and, uh, and that therefore if there is neutral selection, R disappears. So that if I, this is my own, to put it in plainer language, should have marked that in blue so that you didn't get confused. The mean time to a new function requiring two steps to get there, one of which is not selected against and one of which is selected for, is 1 over 2 times n times u1 times the square root of u2 generations. And the square root of u2 turns out to be a lot less than u2. If u2 is 10 to the 10th, then u the square root of u2 is 10 to the fifth. So the square root of u2 is much smaller than the naive ex expectation of 1 over 2 n u, u1 u2. It's just what you would normally think of. And the reason for that is because u2 doesn't have to wait until all of the population has converted to u1. So you can have a uh, it can wait until, let's say, half the population, or a third, or even two or three individuals, or maybe the first individual. Uh, it's not very probable, but the bigger the population size that's, that's uh, got the U1 variable, uh, the uh, less time it's going to take, and that's why you get a square root instead of the standard formula. Okay? Now they go to attack B. The edge of evolution, our final example of waiting for two mutations, concerns the emergence of chloroquine resistance in P. falciparum. Genetic studies have shown C. Wooten et al. I apologize that that's supposed to be all small caps and I couldn't figure out an easy way to do that real quick. Um, but um, all of the names that are referenced are that way. Uh, Wooten et al. that this is due to changes in a protein PCFRT, uh, PFCRT, with that, and that in the mutant strains, two amino acid changes are almost always present. One switch at position 76 and another at position 220. And so far, he and B are entirely in agreement. This example uh, plays a role in the chapter entitled The Mathematical Limits of Darwinism in Michael Behe's book, The Edge of Evolution. And he cites Behe. So B is now in the peer-reviewed literature, at least as a reference. Um, <coughs> arguing that, one, there are one trillion parasitic cells in an infected person. Two, there are one billion infected persons on the planet. Notice that this is directly pulled from that paragraph I read you. 
And then three, and it's interesting that, um, that for some reason the proofreaders missed that that should be three. Chloroquine resistance has arisen only 10 times in the past 50 years. He concludes that the odds of one parasite developing resistance to chloroquine, an event he calls a chloroquine complexity cluster, are about 1 in 10 to the 20. You've seen the math, and uh, it's pretty straightforward. Ignoring the fact that humans and falciparum have different mutation rates, I want you to pause there for a little bit. That's just a kind of an aside. He didn't even account for that. Um, are humans more or less likely to have a mutation per genome than falciparum parasites? I think they're less likely, which means that the human case is worse than the falciparum case. But, uh, you know, he just throws this out as a barb without having people think about, well, what happens if you actually do the math? Um, he then concludes that, on the average, for humans to receive a mutation like this by chance, we would have to wait 100 million times 10 million years, be he 2007, page 61, which is 5 million times larger than the calculation we have just given. We'll come back to that calculation in just a minute. So he's overestimated by 5 million times. Indeed, his error is much worse. To further sensationalize his conclusion, wait a minute. If the answer that he gave was correct, it's not sensationalizing it to point out the implications, is it? But see, you're digging the knife and be as hard as you can, whether it's fair or not. He argues that there are 5,000 species of modern mammals. If each species had an average of a million members, and if a new generation appeared every year, and if this went on for 200 million years, the likelihood of a single CCC appearing in the whole bunch over the entire time would be only about one in 100. Now, they say, if we do our calculations, 2n is 10 to the 6, and, m1, and mu1 equals mu2 equals 10 to the minus 9, theorem 1 predicts a waiting time of 31.6 million generations for one pre-specified pair of mutations in one species with the square root of u2 having reduced the answer by a factor of 31,600. So it happens all the time. Now, we're certainly not the first to have criticized Behe's work. Lynch, 2005, has written a rebuttal to Behe in Stoke, 2000, Snoke, 2004, which is widely... Now, Notice that Behe and Snoke didn't say anything about the CCC. That was the edge of evolution. So he's saying, oh, somebody else said Behe in another article was wrong. See, what you're doing is you're trying to discredit Behe. You're not trying to actually find the truth. Um, which is widely cited by proponents of intelligent design. See the Wikipedia entry on Michael Behe. Uh, of course, Behe and Snoke replied to that and made a very cogent reply, and Lynch never came back at it. But we'll leave that as, uh, as an aside. <clears throat> Behe and Snoke consider evolutionary steps that require changes in two amino acids and, and argue that to become fixed in 10 to the 8th generations would require a population size of 10 to the 9th. One obvious problem with their analysis is that they do their calculations for n equals one individual, ignoring the population genetic effects that produce the factor of the square root of two. Uh, Lynch, 2005, also raises other objections. Well, Behe, I think, seemed a tempting target to them, politically correct, to attack, making an estimate that could apparently be proved wrong by mathematics. There are two problems. Number one, least important, be he's not wrong. Durrett and Schmidt's estimate is based on mathematical assumptions. Behe's estimate is based on deductions from population data. That is to say, Behe is as close to experimental as we can get. And if I got a choice between experiment and theory, I'm going with experiment <laughs> most of the time. For all we know, 
the individual mutations that compose the CCC are selected against, in which case Behe's answer is correct. In fact, there's some evidence that it should be selected against because if it weren't selected against, then the probability of having that mutation or not having that mutation should be simply random between the two. The fact that most ma malaria, parasi uh, malaria parasites happen to have the wild type, instead of the mutation in 76, for example, that could lead to the, the next one, means that 76 must be, in general, disadvantageous. So probably the CCC is a slightly selected against mutation with another um, slightly ex uh, selected against mutation, and the combination of them w in the absence of chloroquine is definitely se selected against because if you have um, malaria and you let chloroquine resistant and chloroquine sensitive strains just grow, the chloroquine sensitive strains will outgrow the resistant ones. It's only when you put chloroquine in that it becomes important. Be he and Durrett and Schmidt could both be right. So the, all that twisting of the knife really didn't do any good. But perhaps more important than that, they make an estimate for the edge of evolution. It's not Behe's estimate, but it's an estimate, and here's the estimate. Humans, we now show that two coordinated changes that turn off one regulatory sequence and turn on another without either mutant becoming fixed are unlikely to occur in the human population. Flat out says it's not going to happen, even with a neutral mutation. Ignoring for the moment, I'm still quoting Durrett and Schmidt, that one of the assumptions is not satisfied. Theorem 1 predicts a mean waiting time of, and there's a bunch of mathematical stuff that's very hard to reduce to a slide, that finishes up with 8.66 times 10 to the 6 generations. Multiplying by 25 years per generation gives 216 million years. Maybe 25 is too high, but it's still, there are 216 million years. Now, as shown in tables 1 and 2, um, notice that they said ignoring that one of, the, uh, one of the conditions was not met. They said that, well, if you, if you do this in a quasi-experimental way, just telling the computer, here are the variables, play with them. We have simulation results for humans using the exact parameters above. In 10,000 replications, the simulation is 6.46 million generations, which is only about 75% of the predicted value. So it's off, but it's off by, you know, three quarters. Not bad. Multiplying by 0.75 reduces the mean waiting time to 162 million years still over 100 million years, still a very long time. Our previous work has shown that in humans, a new transcription factor binding site can be created by a single mutation in an average of 60,000 years. But as our new results show, a coordinated pair of mutations that first inactivates a binding site and then creates a new one is very unlikely to occur on a reasonable time scale. Now that's, ooh, we're being extreme. To be precise, the last argument shows that it takes a long time to wait for two presupposed mutations with the indicated probabilities. Now, maybe the probabilities are less, so they, they go through a probability of seven to eight match for a specified eight-letter word is um, that probability. So in a one kilobyte stretch of DNA, there's likely to be only one such match. However, Lynch Notes that transcription factor binding sites can be found within a larger regulatory region, so there's more bases to select from. And if one can search the new target sequence in 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 6 base pairs, there are many more chances. Indeed, since 1 fourth to the 8th is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 5th, then in 10 to the 6 base pairs, we actually expect to find 16 copies of the 8-letter word. So it's not that unlikely we can get there. Now, these are my comments now. Behe stated that the probability of CCC was 10 to the minus 20th. In the human population, this would work out to an average waiting time of 10 to the 15th years, which is off the scale. Dirt and Schmidt now em em 
estimate the waiting time at 162,000 years, with only 5,000 years separating five chimpanzees. And what? Five million. I'm sorry, you're correct. With only five million uh, years separating chimpanzees and humans, this is still leaves a crude probability. Uh, this is crude. It just you know, and it might be you know off by a factor of two or something like that. A one in 32 for neutral mutation followed by an advantageous one. It's still you're you know that's um, less than the one in 20 that we allow for uh, journal articles to be wrong. Um, and to get two of them, you know, you multiply those probabilities, and basically at some point you have to say this is just too unlikely. Um, and so now we can cite the peer-reviewed literature, namely Durrett and Schmidt, for the idea that neutral mutations are quite improbable in human evolution. And of course, um, uh, Science and Human Origins does, in fact, cite that very thing, and points out that humans have 20 new gene families so each one of those families has to have not only the creation of the new genes from the old genes, but it has to have the creation of the new one, you know, the original new gene from scratch. They're present in humans, they're not present in chimps, and so you're going to have to have them come up with, um, and by the way, they're not present in anything else either as far as we know. Um, and so you're going to have to come up with a whole brand new gene, and each step has to be selected because we've already seen that to have a step that's neutral followed by an advantageous selection yeah. isn't going to happen. And a gene has a thousand bases. And a gene has a thousand bases. That's a small gene. Wow. From a selfish perspective, if you're looking at this purely as, you know, uh, atheistic evolution fighting intelligent design, and we've got to win this any way we can, they should never publish the paper. It was a strategic mistake. The edge of evolution is now, first, a legitimate subject. So even if Behe is wrong, they still have to deal with, well, what is the right answer? And some non-ID estimates il illustrate the problem the subject poses for neo-Darwinism. Mm -hmm. But you may have different perspectives, and uh, you're welcome to give them. Yeah. Um, you, you read a little more deeply the discussion of uh, the, the, the authors. Surely, they must have said something uh, about how they saw their contribution to the argument. What, what did they have to say? Uh, well, the, the discussion starts out, this is highly improbable in humans. So basically, they're confirming what the Behe point. was saying. I mean, they're, you know, he says Behe's off by a factor of 10 to the fifth, but you know, uh, but it's, it's still a huge enough number that it's extremely unlikely. That's right. So in what way is the smaller number a comfort? <laughs> Doesn't look like it. And the other thing is, supposing that you come up with something that's slightly selected against, then Behe's number is correct. Mm. We have a comment back there. Well, I said some of this before, but Durrett and Schmidt raises it again. And uh, this is what seems to me to be a misunderstanding of the basic nature of probability theory or its application to chance events, truly chance events. And the example that I used before was the state lotto. Let's say that you have 50 numbers, you're going to pick six of them, and one of them has to be in the last place. So let's say the chances mathematically of somebody guessing all six with the right one in the last place is one out of 127 million. I've heard that figure. I've never done the calculation, but let's say that's with it. With the proper selection of balls, I'm okay. sure we can make it come out that way. Uh, now, if 127 million people on a given day buy a ticket, 
the chances are one of them will win. That's what that means. Yeah, it's, it's and, one over E, but it's Okay, let's it's suppose, reasonable. though, that only a million people buy a ticket. Mm -hmm. Does that mean, then, that it will take 27 times as long for someone to win? No. In fact, what it means is, no matter how many people buy, on any given day, the chances of, win of a win are exactly the same for any one ticket in the group. If you're buying them sequentially, uh, then uh, you have just as much chance that the first one you buy will win as that the 127 millionth one that you buy will win. That's what probability theory in terms of chance means. Uh, time doesn't enter into the factor at all. It doesn't take any length of time for an improbable event to occur. It only, the only question that does affect it is how large the population is that's right. playing the game or trying the event. Well, yeah, but the other thing that the, the probability theory will tell you is that if you personally are buying one ticket, then you should not borrow against your winnings. Well, of course, uh, you can apply this and be proved. <laughs> but now when we're talking about life, let, let me add one thing here. When we're talking about life, if you take the current argument to the present state of cosmology and so on, the recent work of Kepler is now interpreted as meaning with a survey of about 2% of the sky, we estimate that there are 100 billion uh, stars in our own galaxy with planetary systems, and there are 100 billion galaxies in our universe and some people think there may be an infinite number of galaxies in, in a multiverse. And so the situation is very much, in that case, like the night on which 127 million people buy a lotto ticket. Somewhere in all of that, and we could be that place, life could occur immediately. It wouldn't, it wouldn't take any given length of time, if it is true the chance of that. One exception, or a different point of view I'd point out, is that in biological systems there are also probabilities that they will reverse and go the other way. And one of the problems you have is that you, you totally ignore the, the probabilities of it going the other way in some of these calculations. And, and you do have to deal with the fact that the probability of reversal of those things may be great enough that you, you keep growing those at a higher rate in most systems that do not have control and do not have preset systems to make them happen, catalyst, et cetera, to make them happen. You have the probability of them going the other way. And we don't really deal with that. We, we keep saying we get one positive event, then we have to get another positive event, and, but we don't really discuss necessarily how many reversals would be expected in those calculations. I read recently that there was a report that in England, after certain uh, antibiotics have been stopped because too many bugs have been resistant to it, after, what is it, 10, 15 years or so, there is a reemergence of sensitive bacteria to the very antibiotics that have been stopped uh, 20 years ago. So that's the not just in England, that's happened here in America. Oh, here there was a time when uh, SEPTRA was the best drug for urinary tract infection, for example. Right. And uh, then there became too many resistant organisms and so people stopped using SEPTRA. And then with time, uh, at least in some areas, it has gone back to where most of the organisms are now sensitive again. and with more time it'll probably swing the other way because people's antibiotics use tends to follow the sensitivities. Isn't that interesting? Wh which, which in my mind would suggest that these bugs essentially have a certain, how should I say, penalty for <laughs> their resistance. Uh, the resistance doesn't come free 
It right. comes at a cost of something, which is what basically drives uh, the, the reversal back right. the, the moment wild types that you grow better. That's right, the wild types grow better. A mention was made about the multiverse. Uh, there are certain areas of science, like the multiverse, uh, suggestions that organisms lived 200 million years earlier than you can find their fossils, uh, and so on, that are, you know, purely speculative. To me, the interesting thing is that you can speculate about certain things in science, but you can't speculate about others. And one thing like you maybe was there help in some of these uh, 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 in some of these transitions, like the one from chimpanzees to humans. Well, uh, yes, <laughs> uh, but the the one area that science is a no no is God. Mm -hmm. Why? We'll discuss that next week. Why is it that uh, we have such selective areas of speculation when we're looking for truth you ought to be open to all ideas including the idea that there is a God. Yeah. And in fact the interesting thing is that the multiverse is one that cannot even in theory be tested. No, it, it, this is, uh, you know... It, uh, th th because if the multiverse <laughs> could be tested it would actually be part of our universe then. Multiverse is a fragrant violation of probability theory. Of course. Good morning again. I'm sure that many of you didn't know where I, you thought, I thought I was going last week. It was the 11th hour. It was 12 o'clock. And so I had this big canvas and uh, I was putting paint a little bit here and there and I mentioned several different. Now in the multiverse, I'll come back to that in a moment. And I hope I won't overstep this part because I don't want to bore anybody. But let me say this. A simple thing, I started out last week and I said, kindergarten time. And what I meant was, I'm looking at all this wonderful information, the books, but I didn't just come to this. To this. this is not just a, it's not a hobby necessarily with me. But why not we're taking science and trying to bring it into religion? Why not? And this is not simplistic thinking. Take, we're biblically based. Take religion, or take the Bible. We're taking the science and trying to uh, put it with the Bible. And why not take the Bible and address the science? Now, when we were at Oxford, I was privileged to have a special library card to go into the wonderful Bodleian Library. And I spent many, many very important hours there with those excellent uh, librarians who were so very, very helpful. And so what I'm thinking is that it seems like we don't want to mention, we're timid about mentioning the Bible. And here we sit about to go to church. I'm not a fanatic or anything like that. We're, we seem to have almost apologetic to bring the Bible in. We're, take, we're totally on the science. Now we're, we didn't just, we didn't buy, we didn't pay to go to Oxford. And what I'd like to say is this. I left off last, last week mentioning where that bottleneck came in. And what I'm say, thinking, I made a few notes, and I, and I probably won't go into them because I don't want to take time from others. But I'm going to go back to that Genesis scripture where it says that Cain killed his brother and that, and we've heard this from childhood, and then God came and said that your brother's blood cries out from the ground. This is etymology we're talking about here, biblical etymology. And the translation in the King James, I like it because it's extremely poetic. I've read many, many, many translations. And uh, so Cain says, don't put me, he says, you don't have to leave. 
the garden. And Cain says, don't put me out there. They will slay me. God puts a mark on him and then says that Cain goes to the out to east of Eden to the land of Nod. Now, let me skip to Genesis 6. It says that uh, the sons of God came unto the, the daughters of men, and when I look at the translation, it said, well, they came from heaven and, and so forth and so on. I'm sure you all have read that, too. Then it said, let me go back now to Cain, Cain that he married his sister. There is not a shred that he married, he took a wife, and our denomination has said that, uh, maybe they're not saying it anymore, I hope not, because it, it, it just absolutely is abrasive to my intellectual consciousness, and I have to be not pseudo-intellectual about it, but I've got to be pristine in my intellectual, in terms of my own energy and spirit. And so I think that we ought to address at some point, this, we have the science, we, we know what, uh, what uh, uh, Richard Dawkins over in Oxford, while we were there, that he was heralding his uh, uh, evolution uh, story that he, and we know, we know about him, fine. We were there at the same time we were working at the Vaudelian and Dr. Lee was teaching. So I would like to ask, I can't do it now, it's getting late and someone else needs to speak, but I need to, t I want to talk at some point, if you could address or someone even now, if they want to, Maybe you would want to do this. I'm back here, and I'll just be very brief here. Homo erectus, half a million years ago. I made these notes this morning. And then we come down. Homo sapiens here. Uh, uh, Swans well, we have, we've covered this before over the years. Lee Swanscom and Steinem and Vertizolis. And then somewhere in there, uh, we've, we're going to see that we've got Neanderthal. We're not quite sure, but he has tools. He buries. He's got a religious some kind of religious uh, creative thinking there about uh, the, the heavens or something. We don't know if it's that, but he's burying his dead. And then we come down, we're not sure, Cro-Magnon, Homo sapiens, we're not sure about that. We put a question mark there. But now, three, three, Lee, why don't you, let's talk about that for a minute. You want to just wait, why don't you? Well, yes. I'll just sum it up in sum a, up. a yeah. sentence or two. The, the question is, do we want to try and reinterpret science to fit yes. the Bible? How about taking a look at reinterpreting some of the things in the Bible that have been neglected that seem to support the scientific view you have here, such so. as that the bottleneck, Adam and Eve and their children, weren't apparently the only humans on Earth at that time since Cain went over into the land of Nod and found a wife and was afraid that others would kill him unless you take the position that it, the wife was his sister and that the people that were going to kill him were brothers and that none of those happened to be mentioned. There was no mention ever of her. And then you hear later that the sons of God married the daughters of men over in the land of Nod. Now, who were these uh, people? Are they some of these people we've been talking about or that we brought up like Steinem Man and Vertizolis Man and so on? The question is then that we're posing here, is it really evolution versus intelligent design or creationism or is it evolution and creationism and intelligent design? And if well, so, maybe your suggestion that God worked through evolution to create at some point and there was a radical break there or not. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I think that that's a, a, a good question. And I think we should, uh, I think we should uh, uh, go into that at, at some depth. It's 11.30 now. I know some of you have to, to go now. Uh, but uh, we'll return to that question. I think it's a fair one. Uh, yes? I like the idea of faith challenging science, but if you're going to use the Bible, the problems you have in science are nothing compared to the problems of the Bible and the way people see it. And while you scientists may disagree on matters of faith, we'll fight to the death. Allah Akbar! because it's, it's religion, 
it's eternal, it's all of these things. So mm -hmm. I, like, I like her spirit, but I warn her, it would result in bloodshed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and that is that religion is no more controversial than science is. Right. People often imagine that science is settled, but last week my wife mentioned Lord Kelvin saying that all the discoveries had been made by the end of the yes. 19th century, and it was just a matter of doing more accurate measurement and applying it further. And that would be uh, 30 years. And that's why. The law of gravity has been superseded by the theory of, of, uh, of relativity, and nobody wants to call it a law because they're relativity afraid it'll go to. Quantum theory came along, and the, here's the point. Right now, they're trying to come up with a final theory that puts relativity and quantum together with gravity, and nobody can do it. Einstein tried it. Right here in religion, you've got essentially the same problem. Evolution seems to be valid uh, in many directions. You've been showing us week after week, and yet you feel equally certain that intelligent design enters it in somewhere, but how do you put the two together? I'd say the two problems are equal, equally problematic, and that religion and science are equally controversial. The first consonant of the Bible in the word Bereshith in Genesis can be interpreted in a multitude of ways, and the Jews have done so. And it depends upon the vowels that you put with that consonant, whether it says in a beginning or in the beginning. There are no... Uh, or in beginning. Or just beginning. And so you begin with the first consonant, and you can almost argue every consonant of the scriptures from, a, from many different ways. Uh, I warn you that probability theory is child's play compared to <laughs> biblical interpretation. Well, with that, it looks like we will be ending, or, or Leonard, you had something. I would just <coughs> caution that uh, to try to make the uh, conclusions that you've been making may not realize that the, the first part of Genesis says extremely little about the, the time before the flood. It, it's, it's not its purpose to give detail. And how, how long was it until Cain found Nod, or how, how many people were there by then? I mean, we just don't know any of that. And I think be, there, there's little p a reason to make the kind of conclusions you've made based on that. One more comment? I was just thinking that we need to take the whole Bible and compare one part to the next, and then and that will present a harmonious whole. Um, it's trying to split things up that has caused a lot of problems. Or read in when God says, "In six days, He made," and the Lord spoke from Sinai and said, "In six days, the Lord made heaven and earth." That's pretty conclusive, and I don't think we want to f look for anything in the Bible that's, well, I would uh, venture that everything else in the Bible is going to be in harmony with that. If it, if it isn't, then uh, it's not worth following, of course, but, but we know that it's been shown through the centuries to be uh, a reliable guide, inspired of God. Uh, I would just add to that comment. Uh, uh, one person uh, a couple of years ago here in, in this vicinity uh, stated that there are 27 creation stories in the Bible. I pointed out to him, and not a one of them talks about millions of years. <laughs> Well, with that, uh, come back next week to be uh, informed about where science went wrong and what to do about it.